Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Psalms. Psalms, there's a lot of stuff in that Psalm, so it's all about that one huge book, the biggest book in the Bible. This is lesson number seven in that series for February 17 of 2024, entitled, Your Mercy Reaches Unto the Heavens. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we are seeking to delve into understanding this book. We wonder how you decided to inspire these writers to write what they wrote. We wonder exactly what all you wanted to say to us. We need to study the words and compare them and dig in deeper as we will do so in this lesson. Forgive us where we have failed you. May we do better and may the day when we can talk to you about it come soon as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is God's mercy? <coughs> Psalms 57, 9 through 10, Jim. So I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing, excuse me, I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds, New King James Version. The psalmist recognized, and we should also, that we have nothing good to offer to God to pay for our salvation. Perhaps the simplest way to understand this issue is to ask the question, if God has simply decided to ignore humanity because we have caused him so much pain, is there anything that we could do in response? We would simply pair... I understand that... that the infinite or the mind of the infinite one they don't understand that to even yeah. ask a question like that yeah well we're not saying he's going to do it i'm just saying what would happen if he did we would simply perish in our sins which of course many will anyway god not only created us but also he sustains us every minute our hearts beat and our lungs breathe etc only because of god's power even the devil would perish if God were not sustaining him. So why does God continue to support skin, sin? Or I'm does he? himself. What? White. What? I was reading. Oh, okay. So, so intelligent creatures can learn to what to reject and learn yeah. to choose the good. Sure. In the entire world, if the entire world were turned to turn irretrievably sinful, what would God do? I don't think we'd have any choice but just to, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but just let us go. Ellen White stated that it is only because of the presence of the righteous that God continues to sustain this world. Charles? From the writings of Ellen White, if the presence of 10 righteous people would have saved the wicked cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, as noted in Genesis chapter 18, is it not possible for God would yet, in answer to the prayers of his people, hold in check the workings of those who are making void his law? Shall we not humble our hearts greatly before God, flee to the mercy seat, and plead with him to reveal his mighty power? Okay, there's another statement dealing with that, those issues. Gordon? This is from Spirit of Prophecy. Were it not for the few righteous who inhabit the earth, the wrath of God would not be delayed a moment from punishing the wicked. But the prayers and good works of the people of God preserve the world. They are the savor of life. But if Christians are only so in name, if they have not virtuous characters and godly lives, they are like the salt that has lost its savor. Their influence upon the world is bad they are worse than unbelievers. Wow. That's the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 214. So that's, that's a series that was written by Ellen White prior to that was the a, Conflict yeah, of the Ages. That was a great controversy series written specifically for Seventh-day Adventists yeah. before she expanded it to make, make it more broader and, and involve all Christians are all, all people. About the 1850s? 1860s, 1870s. 1870s. 1870s, early 1870s. So just to be clear on our understanding here, when it talks about he would punish the wicked, what does that mean? 
You would let the consequences of their Let them behavior. experience the consequences of their own behavior. Psalms 136, it's a chant, giving thanks to God, quote, for his love is eternal. Uh, talking about all the different ways in which God has blessed the children of Israel, each one demonstrating that God's love is eternal. Like the children of Israel, we can praise God because His covenant remains in effect and can be depended upon. Wow. The children of Israel could look back at the way God rescued them from Egypt, Egyptian slavery. What can we as Christians look back to as His, his assurance that God will help us and care for us? The life of Christ. Myra? From the Bible study guide, uh, it says, read Psalms 136. It's a lengthy what, psalm, so we, yeah. we couldn't put it all in here. Go ahead. What thought predominates in this psalm? Where does the psalmist find evidence for his prevalent claim? Psalms 136 summons God's people to praise the Lord for his mercy as revealed in creation. Psalms 136, 4, 9, 4 to 9. And in Israel's history, 10 to 22. Mercy, he... Hebrew, Hebrew is chesed. Okay. Steadfast love conveys God's goodness and loyalty to his creation and to his covenant with Israel. The psalm shows that God's immense power and magnificence is grounded in his steadfast love. The Lord is the, Lord, the God of gods and the Lord of lords, which in Hebrew idiom that means the greatest God. Is that in reference to all the different gods? Yeah, I mean, basically, well, look what it says next. Oh, okay. The greatest God, not that there are other gods, but that he is the only God. And I've wondered on many occasions when it says in the first Psalm, there are no other gods beside me. I have wondered why he doesn't say, because originally I thought, well, it's because he, there wasn't a way to say that in, in, in the ancient Hebrew. But you go along, and I can't tell you the exact verse right now, but not too far after that, he just says there aren't any other gods. So well, I don't... He, but he's, he recognized in, in the ten, what we call the Ten Commandments that there were other, what are called gods, and those are oh, Elohim. Yeah. Okay, if you say what are called gods, that's another story. That's the Elohim, yeah. which are created beings. They are not the infinite one. Yeah. Well, if we can get, if we can get over that hurdle, Man, life and, and communication and understanding would be, would be far better instead of having about well, ten, 10 deities in the Old Testament. They think they're one God. Only, the only one, excuse me, monotheist religion is Islam. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're not going there. Well, it, it's, it should, it's foundational to yeah. everything we understand from the Bible. Okay, the Lord's great wonder Wonders which cannot be replicated by anyone else are the undeniable demonstration of his dominion. God created the heavens, the earth, and the heavenly bodies, which are worshipped by the pagans, Deuteronomy 4.19. The Psalms, however, strip the pagan gods and, by extent, every human-based source of competence of their authority. They are more uh, mere products of the creation. They are merely created things, not the creator, a crucial, crucial distinction from our Bible study guide. Many, many verses in scripture, not only in the Psalms, but also in places like Romans 1, 20 through 23, tell us that there are no other gods. The creator is the only God, but how do you explain the following verse? Okay. Deuteronomy 4, 19. Jim, you have know all about the gods. Tell us about this verse. Do not be tempted to worship and serve what you see in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Lord your God has given these to all other people for them to worship, American Bible Society. Okay. So there are your other gods? Well, that's only part of them. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, well, you take in, in Genesis chapter 3. Yeah. Okay. That was a, an Elohim that was a, thou there like one of us. That was an Elohim. That was not Yahweh doing the talking. Well, you would have a hard time proving that. No, it can be yes, proved. It depends on your on your uh, barrier to to uh, changing your mind. So, how are we to understand this verse? 
Did God intend for, their other, for other nations to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars? What is implied by the fact that God's love and mercy endure forever? Well, the truth is that the Bible writers recognize that these other peoples were worshiping those things. It didn't that God told them to worship those things. They were worshiping those other things. Well, they were, and also the infinite one, the creator, Yahweh, has permitted Satan and all his minions to influence they, oh, they, 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 they communicate. Yeah. They, they, they have got rather intimate with them. The Satan is called the prince of this world, right That's in the right. New Testament. Absolutely. The plan of salvation centered in the life and death of Jesus will never need to be repeated. It will provide an eternal safeguard even for the angels. Charles? That which alone can eventually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. Sig and notice that the future will prevent. Yes. It didn't in the past. It will prevent, okay? Right. The significance of death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the suffering of the Son of God. Now let me interrupt for a second again. Yes. So Jesus died for how many people? All. How many individuals? All. Everyone here on earth and all the rest of the universe. universe. Okay, go ahead. All right. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ for even they are not secure except by looking to the suffering of the Son of God. And I wish we had an hour or two to discuss that. <laughs> it is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guaranteed from guarded uh, from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angels' perfection failed in heaven. Hmm. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lucifer failed. Um, human perfection failed in Eden, and the paradise is of bliss. All who wish to secure security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation making manifest the justice and love of God provides an eternal safeguard against the detection, defection, and unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Ellen White, Science of the Time. Now, I have, I have explained that passage on several occasions by this way. If a million years from now, God creates some new creatures, and one of them should decide that uh, he wants to rebel, he doesn't want to do it God's way. God will simply ask all of us to gather around who've been through this whole sin thing. He said, set the person down. Well, first he would set the person down there and say, I want you to look at the story of what happened the last time someone rebelled. And he would show them the panorama of the whole story from beginning to end. If he still wants to rebel, he would set that person down there and then he would say to all of us, what do you think I should do about this person? And we would say simply, step back, leave him alone and he will perish. And nobody would have any problem at that point in time with God doing that because they understand the consequences, the, the story of the plan of the whole great controversy and its consequences. Hopefully it's just gonna be the plan that it not, does not happen because affliction shall not rise up the second time. Yeah, we'll, we'll be so convinced that and that's we why. want to do this. Yeah, that's why I yeah. would say. And then of course, yeah. the marks will always be there. Probably no one else in the Bible had his life and his sin spelled out in more detail than did David. After his sin with Bathsheba and arranging for the death of her husband Uriah, David was confronted by Nathan the prophet who pointed out his sin. And that story is in 2 Samuel 12. Two Psalms spell out David's uh, contrition, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. You want to give us a little view of that, Gordon? From the Bible study guide, King David pours out his heart before the Lord asking for the forgiveness of sin during the spiritually darkest moments in his life, 2 Psalms 12. 
Forgiveness is God's extraordinary gift of grace, the result of the multitude of your tender mercies. King David appeals to God to deal with him not in accordance with what his sin deserves, but in accordance with his, that is God's, divine character, namely his mercy, faithfulness, and compassion. From the Bible Study Guide for Monday. Yeah, and of course, quoting from various places in the Bible. Every one of us is a sinner. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence, Romans 3, uh, 23, and that's from the Good News Bible. Since there, yeah, comment. Um, he talks about forgiveness through that passage there. When you get down, the, the, the text says in Psalms 51, that implies, doesn't Psalm 51 create in me a new heart, a yeah. clean heart? That implies a, a restoration or a healing process rather than forgiveness. When yeah. for people are forgiven, generally nobody learns, any, learns their lesson. Yeah. It's, it's healing process that needs to be done. And, and this, the, these comments by the by Bible study guide are lacking. Since there's nothing that we can do by ourselves about our past sins, we all deserve to die. David recognized how terrible his sin was. Psalms 51, 1. Be merciful to me, O God, because I, because of your constant love, because of your great mercy, wipe away my sins from the Good News Bible. Okay, and look at Psalm Exodus 12, 34, 6 and 7. The Lord then passed in front of Moses and called out, I am the Lord, I, the Lord, am a God who is full of compassion and pity, who is not easily angered and who shows great love and faithfulness. I keep my promise by for thousands of generations and forgive evil and sin, but I will not fail to punish children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation for the sins of their parents. Ooh, you know, what that, happened there? You use the Good News translation. I've, a few weeks ago, I went through the, using the ESORD uh, pre, free Bible program and pumped, typed in the word uh, punish and punishment. And I came up with about 600, in the Good News translation, about 600 words of, of punish and punishment. The RSV, about 50. Uh -huh. it, it, punish is a big deal with the, the Good News translation. They, they just love punishment. Yeah, well, it's the results of sin. That's what they're intending to yeah, but imply. It does, sometimes they put the word punish in there and it, it does not apply, but it, it fits their, the paradigm of the translators or compilers, uh, uh, the committee of which nothing of greatness has come out of a committee. So how do these verses, so it's Ezekiel 18, where it says the son is not to, to die for the sins of his father or vice versa? Let's look at, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 18, 20. It is the one who sins who will die. A son is not to suffer because of his father's sins nor a father because of the sins of his son. So how does that fit with our passage we were just looking at? Well, uh, yeah, Ezekiel 18, great, great chapter. Yeah, hold on. I'm sorry, my computer jumped on me here. We just finished. As you read through, uh, as you read on through Psalm 51, and especially verses 6 to 19, it is clear that God's forgiveness is intended to lead us to change our behavior. And of course, that fits with Romans 2 4, where Paul said, or perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. <clears throat> and our Bible study guide says, Divine forgiveness involves... That was what we just read, wasn't it? Yeah. No? No. Okay. Divine sure. forgiveness involves more than a legal proclamation of innocence. It provides a profound... It produces... Pro pro it produces a profound change that reaches the most inner parts of human self. Psalms 51, 6. I think that's the one created within me heart. Yeah. In your heart. Okay. Hebrews 10, Hebrews 4, 12. It brings about a new creation. Uh, Psalms 51, 10, John 3, 3 to 8. The Hebrew verbs bara, translated create, depicts divine creative power, Genesis 1, 1. Only God can borrow, only God can produce a radical and lasting change in the repentant person's heart. Second Corinthians 4. Okay, 6. so if you look through the Bible, 
you find out that the word bara is only used from God, for God. Nobody else baras. Okay? So, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, 12. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. Goodness Bible. David was familiar enough with the writings of Moses that he recognized that he should die. Mm. Gordon, you want to read two verses there? Exodus 21, 14 says, But when anyone gets angry and deliberately kills someone else, he is to be put to death, even if he has run to my altar for safety. That's God speaking. Mm -hmm. God speaking through Moses. Leviticus 20:10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of a fellow Israelite, both he and the woman, shall be put to death. Good News Bible. You think that might apply to David? <laughs> yeah, maybe. What would you do if you knew for sure that God's word declared that you should die? Mm. David was truly sorry for his sin. He repented and wrote psalms to express his sorrow. And those psalms have been of encouragement to many sinners down to the generations. Now, when he was saying, Well, sir, he needed for a prophet to point his finger. You yes. are the guy. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> so it, it, it encourages us because God's forgiveness is great. It doesn't yes. encourage us to follow David's example. Okay. The Bible study guide says, If God can forgive David for adultery, deception, and murder, what hope exists for you? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Psalms 130, verses 1 to 3. From the depths of my despair, I call to you, Lord. Hear my cry, O Lord. Listen to my call for help. If you kept a record of our sins, who could escape being condemned? So now I thought we should look a little bit and see what we can learn about the heavenly records. What evidence do we have about the records of our sins that are being kept in heaven? Daniel 7, 9 and 10. While I was looking... Thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on the fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. So what are these books being used for? Maybe well, increase in knowledge. Recording. Book recording. Recording the events. Yeah. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged, to, uh, judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And what else do we know about those books? A very interesting passage found in the writings of Ellen White. Gordon, I mean, I'm sorry. Jim, what do we know? Thus the Jewish leaders made their choice. Their decision was registered in the book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne, the book which in no man could open. In all its vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when the book is, this book is unsealed by the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Ellen White, so, Christ's object list. Okay, where, where, where does it talk about that book? Revelation 5. So, now what have we seen? We've seen the books are going to be opened in heaven before the entire onlooking universe, and then we've seen that uh, there's a book of life, Revelation 12, which basically says the same thing, going to compare the books. And now, what else do we know about those books? Well, it looks like the sins of the of the leaders of, the, of Israel that were, of condemning Christ and so forth, their sins are recorded in those books. Okay, Charles? Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. It was covered with writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel who announced in a light voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open their scroll? 
but there was no one in heaven or on earth in the world below who could open the scroll and look inside it. I cried bitterly because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, don't cry, look, the lion from the Judas, from Judas tribe, the great des descendant of David has, has won the victory and he can break the seals and open the scroll. Now here's a question for you. That scroll is being handled in the very throne room of heaven. This is, does this mean that the Father couldn't open that scroll? Hmm. Have you ever thought about that? Or does it mean that it's the life and death of Jesus which clarify the issues and that's why no one else could open the scroll? Well, how can we not love and praise God for his incredible forgiveness? Gordon? Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 4. The new covenant that I, that is God, will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Okay, so what does it mean? This is Hebrew poetry. I will forgive their sins and I will no, no longer remember their wrongs. So forgiveness means what? No, God chooses that. not to remember. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with his omniscient memory. Nothing at all. He knows exactly what's happened. But he says, we're not going to talk about that. Before uh, you move on, though, uh, the new covenant, uh, well, the uh, law is nailed to the cross. I'll make a new covenant with you. But new covenant is nothing but I will put my law in your heart. Mm -hmm. Write it in your heart. Write it in your Jeremiah heart. Jeremiah 31 and was yeah. uh, uh, Hebrews 9 or yeah. something. Yeah. God's children are, I'm sorry, yeah, God's children are called to wait on the Lord. The Hebrew kawa, wait, literally means to stretch and is the root of the Hebrew word for hope. Thus, waiting for the Lord is not a passive surrender to miserable circumstances, but rather a hopeful stretching of eager anticipation of the Lord's intervention. The psalmist's hope is grounded not in his personal optimism, but in God's word, Psalm 130, verse 5. Faithful waiting on the Lord is not in vain because after the dark night, the morning of divine deliverance comes from our Bible study guide. What would become of the record of sins? Myra, I jumped over you. Do you want to try to take that one? Sure. From Ellen G. White, uh, Bible Commentary, it says, The death of Christ upon the cross made sure that the destruction of him who has the power of, of death, who is the originator of sin, when Satan is destroyed, there will be none to tempt to evil. The atonement will never need to be repeated, and there will be no danger of another rebellion in the universe of God. That which alone can effectively restrain one, restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. And once again, notice the future will prevent, right? The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. Fallen men could not have could not have a home in the paradise of God without the Lamb slain from the foundation from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ. Even, for even they are not secure except in looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy, efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Now, there's a second passage from Ellen White that says, what? The results of Christ's life and death here on this earth is a preservation for who? 
angels the heaven. angels in heaven okay go ahead it's not just for us not just for us not just for me now you i don't know what you guys over there but for me no that's that's often the approach that christians take but that's not what yeah. the bible says without the cross they will be no more secure against the evil than were the angels before the fall of satan that's an interesting thought angelic perfection failed in heaven human perfection failed in eden and the paradise of bliss all who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. And those are Ellen White's quotes as, as put into the FDA Bible commentary. There's nothing wrong. I want to reemphasize this. There's nothing wrong with God's memory. The truth about the plan of salvation will, future, prevent sin from ever recurring. What other incredible things are revealed about God in Psalm 113 and 123? Jim? There is no one like the Lord our God. He lives in the heights above, but he bends down to see the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from their misery and makes them companions of princes and princes of his people. He honors, that is, the sick, it can be the childless wife in her home. He makes her happy by giving her children. Praise the Lord. Good news, Bible. And you think of an example of that in the Bible? Oh, it's a couple Hannah. of them. Hannah. Hannah, yeah. of course, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, Elizabeth. I don't know. Elizabeth. Eliz yeah, as well. Yeah. Psalms uh, 123, verses 3 and 4. Be merciful to us, Lord, be merciful. We have been treated with so much contempt, we have been mocked too long by the rich and scorned by the proud oppressors. Good wow. translation. It's almost impossible to believe and amazing to think that the powerful creator of the entire universe was willing to bend down and care for human beings. Surely we should praise him, uh, praise not only God's magnificence, but also his creative ability and his goodness. That goodness that willingness to bend down and reach for us is expressed in Philippians 2. Charles? I like the King James, but we'll read good news. Wonderful <laughs> passages. Beautiful, beautiful passages. Philippians 2, 6 to 8. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. And I like Philip's rendering of that, the death of a common criminal, because you are crucified because you are regarded as a threat, a, a, a traitor to the Roman government. By the way, he hung on the cross naked. Yes, he did. The life and death of Jesus give us a choice. We can either choose to live lives as close as possible to, his, to the example of Jesus, Jesus and live forever, or we will die that he died separated from his Father on the cross. And if you want to see how that's spelled out, go to the chapter in Desire of Ages entitled, uh, It Is Finished. Well, look at Psalm 103. We don't have time to read a fairly lengthy psalm, but look at the comments about it. Gordon? Psalms 103 enum enumerates the Lord's manifold blessings. The blessings include, quote, all his benefits for a flourishing life. These blessings are grounded in God's gracious character and in his faithfulness to his covenant with Israel. The Lord, quote, remembers, and quote, human frailty and transience and ha has compassion on his people. Amazing. Remembering is more than mere cognitive activity. It involves a commitment that is expressed in action. God delivers and sustains his people. The powerful images in Psalms 103 verses 11 to 16 illustrate the immeasurable greatness of God's grace, which can be compared only to the infinite vastness of the heavens. From the Bible study guide for Thursday. Yeah, if you, if you stop and think about the fact that God would be willing, if we would cooperate, 
to forgive everyone of every single sin that has ever been committed. I mean, it's just mind boggling. Of course, we don't take advantage of it, many of us, but I was, okay. Myra, Isaiah 55. The Lord said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. And I think so many times we forget. Yeah. We put God at our level of thinking and... Uh. Ellen White says some things which I have sort of summarized in these words. We sometimes, how in the world is this going to work? How, how could we possibly get out of this predicament or whatever? And she says, God has a thousand ways. You know, if we can think of even one, if we can think of even one, God has a thousand ways to solve any particular problem. Yeah. Wow. Our Bible study guide says, how then should people respond to God's loving kindness? First, by blessing the Lord. Oh dear, how is that possible? How could we bless the Lord? Blessing is generally understood as an act of bestowing material and spiritual benefits upon someone. Because God is the source of all blessings, how can human beings bless God? An inferior can bless a superior as a means of thanking or praising him. 1 Kings 8, uh, 66. And that, by the way, is, is uh, Solomon's prayer, dedicating the, his temple. And it's a marvelous, marvelous prayer. Also, Job 29, 13. And Job 29 is a chapter that talks about Job's past experience and how, what he did and what kind of life he lived. God blesses people by conferring good on them. And people bless God by praising the good in him. That is, by revering him for his gracious character. That was the first point. Second, by remembering all his benefits and his covenants. So it's not just, okay, as some religious people do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and we thank God for what he's done, but what else are we supposed to do? Remembering all his benefits and his covenant, which is, tells us that we need to change our lives, right? Just as the Lord remembers the people, human condition, and his covenant with his people. Psalm 103, 3 through 13. Remembering is a crucial aspect of the relationship between God and his people. Why is that important? How do we know what God can do? He's already done it. And the fact that, and Paul uses this, he says the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God proves what? He can do the same thing for us if he chooses to do so and if we cooperate. Just as God remembers his promises to the people, so the people are indebted to remember God's faithfulness and respond to God with love and obedience from our Bible study guide for Thursday. And I thought I should put, put at least this one verse from Solomon's prayer in there. Jim? First, first, thing, excuse me, first Kings 8, verse 66. On the eighth day, Solomon sent the people home they all praised him and went home happy because of the blessing that the Lord had given his servant David and his people Israel. Good news Bible. Now, if you were reading one of the more traditional translations, they all praised him, it would be blessed him. Okay? God asks us to continually remember all that he has done for humanity and for us down through the generations. This is one of the best quotes of Ellen White. Uh, yeah. I'm sure many of us memorized yeah. it when we were kids. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplating the life of Jesus Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp its sin, especially the closing ones. Okay, so what, do we, what does it mean when it says, let the imagination grasp each scene? What does that mean? Picture in their hearts. Picture in your own mind. Okay, if I were there, what would I have done? How would I respond to this situation? Mm -hmm. Think of what he went through in those last few hours. And what's really going on there, Satan recognizes that this is curtains chance, for him. Right. This is, you know, you either, this is life or death. You, you either succeed now in getting Christ to sin 
or its curtains for you. So it was a life and death situation for Satan, and Jesus recognizes that it's, it's a life and death situation in the great controversy between the government of God and the government of Satan, because if Satan can prove that God has failed in one way or another, then what kind, oh, that will raise all kinds of questions, right? Yeah, and then that's, uh, we go to Psalms, that thou, O God, may be justified when thou speakest. Mm. That was happening there. Yeah. But and Romans shown to be righteous, so yeah, shown to doing the right thing. Yeah, always, right. God always right. will do the right thing. Yes. But unfortunately, Bible translations make it mess it up. For example, in the NIV, it says, "May you win your case." No, that's not I when, mean. when you judge or something that in Romans three four. Yeah. So. Okay, I'm sorry, Charles. Go ahead. As we As thus dwell upon His great sacrifice for us, our confidence in Him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, 83. And I read that and I say, okay, if I'm sitting, if I'm standing there or, or kneeling there at the foot of the cross, and I realize exactly what's happening in that situation. What other response could I possibly have? Mm. Okay, in addition to Psalm 136, there are many other places in the Psalms where we are reminded that we should give thanks to God because His love is eternal. And once again, Ellen White. From Christ's Object Lessons. We have sinned against him and our undeserve and are undeserving of his favor, yet he himself has put into our lips that wonderful the, that most wonderful of pleas, do not abhor us for thy name's sake, do not disgrace the throne of thy grace, thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Jeremiah fourteen. Okay, 21. I'm gonna interrupt for a second. What is he saying here? Did you think about what that means? God is saying if you mess up, you're bringing bad reports on my name. And so we're saying, God, please help us not to, you know, forgive our sins, help us not to mess up, because otherwise it'll look bad for you. Okay, go ahead. What, does, did Jesus ever ex, uh, encourage people to ask for forgiveness? Didn't he say, listen? Wasn't um, that the most important law is to, or what they, Prescription is to listen, and I will write it on your heart. Now, that's a good question. I have to look and see. I think it may, may be in the Sermon on the Mount, but anyway. Go ahead, Gordon. Continuing with Ellen White. When we come to him, confessing our unworthiness and sin, he has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word unto us. Christ Object Lessons 148. And you think of a case in the Bible where God's honor was staked on the behavior of one person? Job. Job, Job yes. Obviously. And if the children of Israel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had just studied and understood the book of Job, how different might that whole story have been? Well, how about us also? Yeah. You know, look. Oh, come on now. The amount of us who aren't saints. You're meddling. <laughs> You're meddling, you're right? Meddling. Get, Maybe. Too, get too close to home, too uncomfortable. <laughs> but Go ahead. That's a, a story that is, what, at least 4,000 or 5,000 years old. Yeah. And uh, really, nobody is, re or very few people have ever find, asked what the questions were, what the uh, all false charges based on the part of the uh, Friends of Job. Yeah. And it, as we will note, experiencing God's wonderful graciousness, forgiveness, and kindness to us should lead us to turn and exhibit those characteristics toward others. Shouldn't we do that same thing for other people if we're expecting God to do it for us, right? Notice these challenging discussion questions from the Bible study guide. Myra, I think that's yours. Yeah. One, what are the practical implications of the fact that God's mercy is everlasting? for the people's salvation. Why does it not mean that one can continue sinning because God's mercy is forever? 
I mean, a lot of people take it that way. Well, God just, I just pray and God forgives my sins, so now I can go back and do them again. Almost like an indulgence. Yeah. You know, prepay. Mm -hmm. Two, how can we reconcile God's forgiveness of our sins with the idea of God's judgment on sin? Now, this is a problem if you think God is up there and he's the, he's the one that's sort of holding our feet to the fire and Jesus comes along, please forgive, please forgive, then that's a problem. But if you understand the great controversy, I don't see any problem with that, do you? No. Okay. Number, number three, how do the expressions of God's mercy in the New Testament fit with those in Psalms? Yeah, well, there's, it's all, all through the Bible. I don't think there's any question about that. Let's take a little more careful and deeper look at the words used in Psalms to describe God's mercy, kindness, etc. And the, the chapters they suggest we read for this is Psalm 51, 103, 113, 123, 130, and 136. Several of those which we've already spent some time on. But the first one is hased, is the most common Hebrew word used for mercy in the Old Testament. It is better understood as loving kindness. Psalm 109, 12 and 16 connects hased with compassion to the poor, the fatherless, and the needy. Because God saves his people from disasters and oppressors, the psalmist praises his name for his merciful actions. So God's mercy reaches down to the lowest level, the people who are in the most difficulty, and what does he do? He lifts them up. Looking at these passages of Scripture, we discover that not only is hesed used to describe God's loving kindness, but his ability to deliver during calamity, persecution, even wandering in the desert, illness, storm, or even bondage. I wonder which group wandering in the desert needed his help. Hmm. Maybe Hes lots needed, but uh, we especially think of Israel, of course. Yeah. Hesed is also described in Psalm 6-4 as God safeguarding our actual existence every day. He preserves and restores life and there's a famous passage in the New Testament where it talks about God preserving and restoring, or particularly preserving our lights. He's the source of our everyday existence. Do you know offhand without looking there? It's actually not quoted here. The famous speech of Paul on Mars Hill or the Areopagus. He says, look, you, you, you worship all these other gods, but let me tell you about the one who's keeping you alive right now. Would you like to know about him? You know, it's there in, in Acts 17. But it's also in Psalm 6-4. Myra, I think that's yours. Oh. Psalm 6-4. Come and save me, Lord. In your mercy, rescue me from death. Good news, Bible. You want to read go ahead and go ahead with the Bible study guide there? Yeah. Finally, Hesed is in eternal. And there's many texts in Psalms there. Because it's part of the character of the Almighty, this assurance is, a, is good news to the believer. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures all generations. So the question is, Jim asked us a question earlier, I'm going to ask another one. Can you find any place in the Bible where God, God's kindness and love failed? Nope. Psalms 100, verse 5, the Lord is good, His love is eternal. So that's why we can say His love is eternal. Well, some would say if He failed on the devil, on Satan. No, well, He gave, a, he gave, gave give up. all intelligent creatures have freedom. I to, agree. That is not a failure on God's part. But some, some people might say. think so. What's that? Some would say. Well, that's because they're uneducated. Let's give them an escape clause there for them. <laughs> you know, let's be okay. kind to them and okay. we'll show a little mercy. With okay. a little mercy. Okay. All right. Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. His love is eternal. So our Bible study guide goes on. Psalms also tells us that the one who requests God's hesed is in a good relationship with him. <clears throat> I mean, you know. Believers should express trust in God with lots of verses and have hope with a lot more verses in order to become the recipients of His mercy. 
The gracious mercy of God is given to those who wait on the Lord. Moreover, faith is a condition of receiving God's has said. So faith, what is faith? What's the, uh, what's the explanation of faith? Evidence of things. Yes, not, not, um, not sin. Well, faith is the word that describes a relationship with God as with a personal friend. So, and in the Old Testament, here is David. No woman was safe around him. Mm. <laughs> Not really, truly. Let's face it. Come on. I just got a book about the, yeah. the, the made-up history of David. I, yeah. I haven't read it. Yet. And I'm just I'm going through this First Kings uh, chapter yeah. one now. You know, and the Sunamite woman that they got her. You know, I mean, hurt him because he was feeling cold. He's da, da, da. A, he's I mean, a but, you know, that's right. But look at he had a relationship. That's the word. He failed and he got up again. He failed. Mm -hmm. And then in the New Testament is Mary Magdalene, the prostitute. She had a problem. The mm -hmm. Lord knew that. But she saw him in his real divine beauty before the cross. He said, wow, that's hope for all of us. And the beautiful part of God's uh, Jesus character was he didn't take advantage of her. He helped her. Uh, there you are. Amen. On her Amen. Way. I wonder why she followed him around. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing that people can be attracted to, to, yeah. to truth. Yeah, I, well, yeah, that's and, and that's exactly why. And safety. Yes. Yeah, and safety. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Here's a woman that he cast out seven devils. Yes. And Acts, I'm sorry, I always want to say Acts. Luke 8, the first three verses says, these women who followed Jesus around were the ones who sustained them, who, who provided food and sustenance and so forth to Jesus and his disciples. Okay, well, back to our passage. Psalm 31, 14 and 17. But my trust is in you, O Lord. You are my God. I call to you, Lord. Don't let me be disgraced. May the wicked be disgraced. May they go silently down to the world of the dead. Oh, well. Yeah. Tell what well, you Uriah did not think that he was wicked, right? It could not be. No, no, no. But again, this man had a problem, but he loved the Lord. Yeah. He had a relationship with him. Yeah. That made the difference. Okay. Charles, I think you got Psalm 119 there. 119, 41 to 42. Show me how much you love me, Lord, and save me according to your promise. Then I can answer those who insult me because I trust in your word. Another word used to describe God's forgiveness and kindness is raham. And our Bible study guide says, Psalms 51.1 uses three words for mercy. Quote, have mercy, Hanan, upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, Hesed, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Raham, blot out my transgressions, from the New King James Version. Now, don't you wish that you knew Hebrew well enough so you could under, understand all the subtleties, of, the subtleties of each one of those words? Okay, you want to go ahead there with Raham? Raham comes from a Hebrew noun that means womb or belly. And there are some verses. A word that contains within it the idea of a mother's tender care for her baby. Raham also represents an emotion that stands in contrast to anger. So the opposite of anger, what would that be? Love, Love. I think. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. This emotion is a kindness that far exceeds what someone deserves. And For that's sure. from uh, a source, New you Testament and International Dictionary. Yeah. Another Hebrew word used for God's mercy is Hanan. Myra? Hanan is a verb that means favor, to be gracious to, generous towards, to take pity on. Usually Hanan is used in the idiom to find favor in the eyes of someone else. And there's several verses for that. Um, this meaning is applied to the relationship between God and his people. Hanan is used primarily with God as its subject. It reveals God's disposition and actions towards his creatures. God freely bestows his favor on willing recipients, but he can withhold his grace when the response to his offer is spurned, or when there is no indication of repentance on the part of his people. Okay, so where's the, where's the blockage when people don't respond? I mean, when there's not a good relationship between humans and God? It's not on God's side. 
Vakaj is on our side. Yet another Hebrew word for God's mercy is Seliha. Seliha, there is, a, there is forgiveness, Seliha, with you. This is referring to God, see the capital there. This expression comes from the Hebrew word sala, or pardon, or forgiveness. The Lord is the only subject of the verb, this verb in the entire Old Testament. So just like the word bara, we looked at earlier, God is the only one who can do this in the, in the full, fullest sense of the word. Saliha means that forgiveness is an act made by God alone. The foundation of this forgiveness is the mercy of the Lord. So where is all the memory of everything that we've ever done? Where is it recorded in the universe? In yeah. God's memory. So who needs, to, <laughs> who needs to say we don't need to talk about that anymore? Only God. In summary, applying these words for God's mercy to our lives, the Bible study guide says there are clear lessons for our spiritual lives in the study of the Hebrew expressions for mercy that we have considered in our study. The obvious lesson is that the Lord uh, gives his amazing mercy to us despite the fact that we don't deserve it. The assurance of this gift should free us from anxiety, a guilty conscience, and the shadows of our past. Hesed, mercy, is more than a tender feeling in God's heart. It is deliverance and protection. It is real action on the part of God to his people. So, I mean, as I started out our lesson, if God chose not to do something for us, what could we do? Nothing, absolutely nothing. The Lord's compassion is eternal. That is, it's always available to us. If we don't avail ourselves of it, it's because we are still in sin and not because we've exhausted the limits of God's love. Mercy, Raham. Now we're going to another word. Embodies the concept that the greatest of all beings is willing to bow down, to lift us up and carry us in his arms. From his superior position, he condescends to show his compassion to us. You've probably heard the story about the two people are walking along in the, on, on, on the shore, and all of a sudden there's only one set of footprints, and the person asks God, what happened? I was in trouble. Where were you? He left me. He said, no, no. I picked you up and carried you in my arms. Those footprints are my footprints. So it's time for us to close there. To find favor before the eyes of Yahweh, Paisa, we are willing and open to receive God's grace. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these marvelous promises, these outpouring of love and grace and forgiveness on your part that make us proud to be a friend of yours. May we praise your name. May we take every opportunity we have to speak about you so that the end may come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.